ladies and gentlemen. We're proud to have our first ever keynote address at the Atlantis Music Conference. Now you may ask why it's our first ever keynote address. Well, it's the first time that we found somebody who is outspoken enough to join us and truly represent what I feel our spirit's about. Steve Gottlieb is the president of TVT Records, the largest, most successful independent record company left. You guys hear about a different merger between labels every week. This guy's been doing it on his own successfully. Seven of the top 10 independent releases this year are on TVT Records. They've had success in the urban arena, uh, hip hop, soundtrack, rock, you name it. Don't know if he's done country, but I mean, I'm sure if he picks up a guitar, he could. So uh, please welcome, without further ado, somebody who I'm happy to call my friend, Steve Gottlieb. Hi. Um, yo, yo, yo. It's the capital, A-C-E-C-A-V-I. We cut hoes like an old pair of Levi's. How many niggas want to be I? I been getting hated on ever since high car was knee high. Transporting dope around blocks. Busting on cops. Can never see ace like my pops. This shit won't stop. We got lyrics on lock. Just cook them when you hear them, they hot. I'm dope if you feel me or not. So just blaze. I been in the game, I think since third grade. So look at us, baby. I appear to be paid. Time made. Heavy last time shit was way. She wasn't go do it, she got persuade. Rolling with the West Coast finest dog, she gon' play. Now look at this man, we in game. Ace Cavs my name, and I'm a big dog like Great Dane. Good deal. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Steve Gottlieb. You didn't know he could rap, did you? <laughs> anyway, I, I uh, wanna thank you all for being here. Um, uh, when Rich uh, asked me uh, to do this, he promised me none of you would listen to anything I had to say uh, uh, because the only thing you really wanted to hear was what I thought of the demo. Um, so with that in mind, I hope uh, that uh, everything I say stays within this room. Um, uh, you know, this is the first time I've ever been asked to do something like this, so I'm a little bit nervous. Uh, I guess they couldn't find uh, a major label president um, <laughs> to do this. And I think we have to have uh, a moment of sympathy because there just aren't enough major label presidents to go around these days. <laughs> With all the shutting down of labels one after the other and, and the mergers and consolidation, you know, people don't realize that it is a very tough year for label presidents. And uh, it has been, over the last couple of years, you've seen, uh, you know, probably 30, 40 imprints disappear like that. Where do those label presidents go? You know, uh, so um, I think um, it's a shame. And uh, that's in part, part of the reason why I'm surprised to see so many people here today. Because uh, uh, I thought Atlanta had better newspapers because where I live, Every day, the headline is that the music industry is dead, uh, that there are no jobs, no deals, um, and no future in music. Um, I don't think those uh, journalists have it right. Um, but they tell the same fairy tale that, um, you know, downloading of music, led to bad financial results at record companies, led to this forced consolidation, led to cutting back costs in every sector and laying off people right and left, led to uh, no longer caring about artist development and only being interested in multi-platinum acts, uh, and led to no jobs, no deals, no future. Um, I don't think that is what's going on in the world today. Um, 
even though that's the way some people report it. Uh, in fact, I think there are, are lots of jobs in the music business. Um, I think people like you are the ones doing them. It's no longer the major labels that are doing those jobs, and as shown by the fact that they've cut their you know, staffs down to the bone. Uh, the major labels have left the field in terms of artist development. That's the real work of a record company. It's not the accounting department, and it's not the invoicing department, and it's not the person typing in, you know, send 50,000 units over to this chain store. Uh, you know, that can any uh, uh, business can do. The real work of a record company is in developing talent and in helping tell the truth about that talent to the public. Um, but, you know, it's a funny thing when you hear the record companies nowadays explain what they do uh, to be about their efficiency and how efficient they can make their back office. And uh, in a way, how much they seem to think that the efficiency of their back office is the key to their success. Um, in any event, um, I don't think I'm saying anything new to any of you when I talk about the majors having left the field and having abandoned the artist development process. I don't think that's uh, a surprise uh, or a controversial statement. It's a lot of people's experience. I guess part of what I want to talk about today is why I think that has happened, um, because it is, uh, I think, the explanation has, uh, um, uh, has to do with where the music industry has come from and where it's, where it's going. And to the extent you are the future, um, I thought I'd share my thoughts today. Um, Okay, well, um, so all of you are doing the work on, um, and you know, part of the reason why what the major label is wanting to do is not hear a demo. What they want to see is the inch thick press pack. They want to see the website. They want to see the BDS of the hit song you already have on radio. They want to see the sound scans for the album you've already produced with name guest artists. Uh, which you've already sold 100,000 units of. They want to see the ticket receipts from your successful live touring base. They want you to have done all the hard work. Um, so in any event, my story is very much a do-it-yourself story. So it is somewhat akin to where many of you may find yourself now. 18 years ago, um, I had a, a kind of crazy idea for uh, a record. Um, I only knew the, the music business as a passion because I was interested in jazz and managed uh, a, uh, a jazz artist um, when I was in college. And I really had no interest in the music business having managed a jazz artist. And anybody who's done that will know that doesn't endear, you know, make you think that the music industry is where you want to uh, uh, put your livelihood. Um, and... Uh, I put together this record of old TV themes. Right away, it was uh, an instant success. Um, uh, and I had huge press um, and huge sales. And uh, very quickly, I mean, the story was I actually had started the record by advertising it on television. And it was all the classic TV themes from Mr. Ed to uh, Star Trek to uh, the Flintstones to Flipper, whatever. And uh, I'd started advertising it on television as, uh, as and uh, I walked into Tower Records and asked them if they would try it at retail and uh, they said it was going to be one of the biggest records of the year. I went up to my apartment, uh, which, uh, um, and, uh, which was also the warehouse, which was also the office. And since I was the only employee, I packed up the records and got in a cab and did the display at Tower Records, and uh, the display sold out that weekend, and that Monday morning I had calls from all the major media wanting to write articles about uh, 
television's greatest hits. And very shortly thereafter, in Syrium, I met with each of the major labels, all of whom wanted to buy me out. And they offered me, you know, big fat seven-figure checks, which uh, for someone who had just started in business was pretty exciting. Um, but something in the back of my mind um, prevented me from wanting to go ahead. And part of it was the fact that I had come to love these little TV themes. And over the year of putting together the record, and I realized that the reason why no one had put out a record like that of old TV themes was because they didn't understand it, and they didn't appreciate it, and they didn't see what was special in this record. Now, I, let me explain. I'm a loser at Trivial Pursuits, and before I started working on television's greatest hits, I. Uh, you know, I, I still don't know the lyrics to half the TV themes. I'm not, I, I'm not a fan of this. I became a fan and began to appreciate it while working on the record. And what dawned on me was the fact that they didn't appreciate it and the fact that I, f I had the feeling that even with a seven-figure check, the following week, they would not take my phone call. They would not know who I was. And they still wouldn't understand the record. I couldn't, made me not want to part with it for any amount of money. And I said, if I feel that way about some TV themes, which prior to starting this, I had no connection with whatsoever, imagine how painful it is for an artist who has his soul and his full creative juice and his whole life experience wound up on what was then vinyl and handing it over to an institution without any sense that they'll remember who he is and what he stands for. The fact that they wanted to buy my record and pay me a lot of money without understanding what its appeal was, and without understanding why it was successful, and without understanding why it connected with people, impressed upon me that there's a difference between recognizing commercial opportunity and really being able to maximize that opportunity. And maximizing that opportunity and really seeing an idea through to its greatest possible potential requires more than a machine that automatically takes orders and builds product. It requires some deeper understanding as silly as it seems, the success of that first record was a truth-telling. It was a question of figuring out why people love TV themes as, you know, in all their silliness and ridiculousness, why those pieces of music were important to people and part of people's lives. It, marketing it was a truth-telling. It was understanding how people approached them and, and, and what the connection they made with it. That is part of what is necessary to break an artist. The fact that they made these offers, outlandish offers to me, without having the underpinning, understanding, made me very nervous. And I felt a label that was better prepared to make a real commitment to artists would have a shot. The second thing that... Um, uh, dawned on me at that time. Well, um, so one thing that founded the, the company from the beginning was a sense of humility that I did not know what the public wanted. I would learn what the public wanted. I didn't know that people were going to love TV themes. I certainly didn't start by loving TV themes. But I would learn what people loved, and I would respect what they'd love, because I realized that part of why they, that record was never done before was because the labels themselves were blind to the fact of what the public really felt. So I started the company with a certain amount of humility and a certain amount of respect 
for the marketplace. I understood that the role of a record company was less about owning the